My name is Molly McMunn. I'm the um, Community Relations and Public Affairs Specialist here at Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And as part of my role, I get to sit on various boards and committees here in the community and have made some fantastic partnerships with some of our community partners, the Communities That Care Coalition being one of them. And of that relationship was born the idea for this event here today. Um, I'm also a parent of a daughter who's 13 years, 14 years old. And um, the conversation amongst my group of friends has been this very topic here, the importance of discussing it with each other, discussing it with professionals, and discussing it with our children. So thank you all for coming. Um, I do want to share quickly, uh, Bay State's mission is to improve the health of the people in our communities every day with quality and compassion. And when I read that, the key word in that statement to me is communities. I didn't say improve the health of our patients. That, of course, first and foremost, we want to improve the health of our patients but we're also committed to improving the overall health and well-being of everyone in our community. That includes quality of life, preventative care, mental health, and educational opportunities such as this. So thank you all very much for coming. We hope to do more of these in the future. And I also want to, um, I have a couple housekeeping notes here. Um, your presenters this evening are Kat Allen. She's the coalition coordinator at the Communities That Care Coalition. So that's lots of C's. <laughs> mix it up all the time. Um, and she'll be giving you more information about the Communities That Care Coalition and the hard work that they do. And Cheryl Pascucci, who's a nurse practitioner here at Bay State Franklin Medical Center, thank you. And um, I also want to let everyone know if you need to use the restrooms, to go out into the main lobby, take a right, take a right after the gift shop, and they're on your left. So <coughs> that's another one of our common questions. And please feel free to help yourself to more food if you'd like to. And I also want to introduce our co-sponsors this evening, if you wanted to come up and say a couple words. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Okay, now I'm not blinded by the director. <laughs> um, my name is Alana Gerjoy, and I am the coalition coordinator for a Greenfield-based coalition. I work with Siobhan and Kara, who we're going to talk to you in just a sec. And we are... Um, a health and wellness coalition that focuses on youth substance use coalition, um, youth substance use and other issues that are related. So youth well-being, youth development, very similar to the Communities That Care Coalition, but we're <coughs> focused on the Greenfield footprint. And Kat will be telling you a little bit more about how we do this kind of work in a minute. I just wanted to say hello to all of you and thank you for coming. We're really pleased to be able to co-sponsor this event. And also to say that we just received federal funding for an additional five years of work. We're really thrilled to be here. We're very happy to have Bay State as a local hospital supporting our work um, through this event and many other ways. And if you're interested in being involved in our coalition, you will get a follow-up email if you said you wanted to hear about other events. And you can then contact us and come to our coalition meetings or other events that we're going to be holding in the local area. So thanks again for being here. Uh, I'm now just going to really briefly introduce Kara and Siobhan, who are going to talk to you about youth and parent engagement. Hi, I'm Kara Younger. I'm the youth engagement facilitator, that's what it is. Um, so I run a youth-led prevention team through the Greenfield, like in the Greenfield footprint. So if you have any kids that are interested in getting involved in prevention, helping support local events, things like that, and just being a good face in the community, send them to me. And I'm uh, Siobhan Fitzgerald. I am doing the parent enrichment, and that's a new role for me with 4 c and I'm really excited about that. So again, if you did check off that you want any more information and anything like that, you'll be hearing from me. So thank you for coming. Thank you. And one last thing I forgot to mention is if you can avoid the center aisle here because um, the camera set up in the back, that would be fantastic. And I'd like to pass it over to Kat Allen. Great. Thank you. Um, Thanks everyone for being here on this very uh, snowy, well, not yet, but potentially <laughs> snowy evening. I'm impressed that so many people made it out. Um, and it's, it's awesome that you are taking your time to be here and learn with us. And thank you again to the hospital. Um, this idea came up and Molly just jumped on it and she had the full support of the hospital and I'm so glad because um, she was able to get the word out in all kinds of ways. Um, I also wanted to introduce some of the people that I work with at the Communities That Care Coalition. So my name is Kat Allen. I'm with the Communities That Care Coalition. And um, Rachel back there and I are co-coordinators of the Communities That Care Coalition. We are a regional coalition. We serve the 30 towns of Franklin County and the North Quabbin. And we work on substance use prevention and nutrition and physical activity promotion for youth, primarily. 
Um, and Jeanette is our evaluation coordinator. She runs the survey, so if you have any um, kids in the schools that have ever taken the youth health survey, um, Jeanette runs that. And Jeanette also is the person who put together this presentation. She is the brains of this operation. I'm just the mouth. So <laughs> if there are questions that I can't answer, I'm going to be like, Jeanette, can you help me out? Um, but in any case, and I also wanted you to introduce Stacy Langnecht who is um, the volunteer chair of our parent education work group for the Community Psych Care Coalition. So if you're interested in getting more involved with uh, substance use prevention or youth health promotion, please talk to Stacy or me and we'd love to have you. So getting started, oh, I put this because I knew I was going to forget. <laughs> disclaimers. Uh, my disclaimers, I already told you that she's the brains of the operation. I am not a doctor and I'm not a scientist or a medical researcher. And so I am presenting the information that we have gleaned from many other sources. Um, and so I just don't want to claim to be uh, more than I am, but I know that people are really interested in this information. It seemed like people wanted to hear it. So um, also, I cannot claim to be unbiased. I don't think there's anyone that could speak on any topic in an unbiased way. Um, I've been working in substance use prevention, youth substance use, use prevention for 16 years. I still can't say it. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, I mean, I, I, uh, I have various opinions and we're gonna do our best to just be objective and let you come up with your own opinions for your parenting practices. But um, So the Communities of Care Coalition is a coalition of schools, human service agencies, local government, law enforcement, businesses, faith-based organizations, parents, and youth. And we work together to improve the health and well-being of young people in Franklin County and the North Quabbin, all the 30 towns surrounding the Greenfield. Um, the outline of my part of the presentation, I'm going to speak for a little bit, and then Cheryl's going to speak, and then we're going to have question and answer. Um, the outline for my piece of the presentation here Four questions I'm going to try to answer. One, how is the developing brain more susceptible to harm than the adult brain? Two, how does marijuana affect the developing brain? Three, how common is youth marijuana use in this area at this time? And four, what can we do to help prevent youth use? Okay, so let's get started. Question number one, how is the developing brain more susceptible to harm? So here we have our <laughs> adolescent, right? Looks like my kid sometimes. Uh, compared to childhood and adulthood, adolescence is a time of heightened sensation and reward seeking, risk taking and impulsivity, peer influence, mood swings, capacity to learn, and exuberance, right? Great things, bad things, hard things, easy things, but different in many ways. Okay, so this is a video that shows, oh gosh, uh, how do I play this video? This is a video that shows the maturation of the human brain. Aha, look at this. Um, from age four to 21, so this is a compilation. Oh, I was too slow and it disappeared on me. No, but I didn't come back, there we go. So, we're gonna watch. So this is the maturation of the human brain from age four to 21. So let's see it again. Um, what you'll notice here is that the brain is maturing from the back to the front. You're looking at it like this. So that's the back to the front. And that's gonna become relevant because of what happens in sort of the back of the brain versus the front of the brain. Um, and this maturation is actually a reduction in the gray matter in the brain. So what's happening during this process is not building new neurons, but a pruning of the existing neurons. We're born with so many, and there's this pruning process, like if you imagine pruning a tree, um, where the neurons that are not used go away, and the neurons that are used get, um, get coded. They turn into neural superhighways, so to speak. So the neurons that get used a lot become faster and more efficient, through this process called myelination, which is basically your brain puts this fatty substance around that neuron so that it's insulated. It's like insulating a, an electrical wire. The impulse can go more directly from one place to another. So again, there's this, this 
process of pruning the neurons that you're not using and myelinating, making more efficient the ones that you are using during, during adolescence. Um, one doctor, Jay Geed, I'm not sure how to say it, uh, described it as the use it or lose it principle. So if a team is doing music or sports or academics, then those are the cells and connections that will be hardwired. If they're lying on the couch or playing video games, then those are the cells and connections that are going to survive. So, you know, you are building, what are your, what are your go-to coping mechanisms when you have big feelings? Um, you're building, you know, all these different um, pathways in your brain during adolescence. By the way, um, please feel free, if there's something that doesn't make sense, I, I am happy to have people sort of jump in and ask questions. If we get to too much of that, I'll stop you, but please feel free to, to stop me for, for now. Um, so this, <laughs> I like this, this um, cartoon, this is the teenage mouse. I can totally get away with this. So during adolescence, um, because the back of the brain <coughs> starts developing, right? So from childhood, you suddenly have this uh, very well-developed amygdala. And the amygdala is the part that is in charge of the reward system. So it's as developed as it will be in adulthood, but what you don't have is the well-developed prefrontal cortex to go along with it. So there's, there's this bit of an imbalance where the rewards become really great, but the um, control to balance out those rewards isn't necessarily as great. And that's why there's heightened risk taking and sensation seeking among adolescents. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like we need risk takers, we need, so there are plenty of advantages to that, but it is a, um, a difference here. This is the, a, a simplification of the brain's reward system. And um, so here we have two neurons and dopamine is the chemical that gets released from one neuron into the other for pleasure, for rewards. Like, yes, I got that food, I got that um, sex, I got that chocolate, whatever it is. Uh, the dopamine system is what sends that pleasurable signal. Um, and from the neuron's point of view, so here's like a normal reaction to a really yummy meal. You get that sense of pleasure. Um, drugs, on the other hand, uh, you're getting a huge amount of dopamine there. So just a flooding of dopamine in that um, synaptic space there. Um, so when the brain's reward system is repeatedly overstimulated, it adjusts to reduce the dopamine levels. So just like if you're exposed to loud sounds a lot over and over again, you lose those little hairs that sense the loud sounds. If you're exposed to a lot of dopamine, those dopamine receptors get pruned away. So your own ability to feel pleasure gets reduced over time. So this is um, brain images, compilations of a person with a substance use disorder and a healthy subject when exposed to something pleasurable. So here we have high dopamine levels. This is somebody who's not currently at, you know, high on a drug, not currently using a drug, but, but has been you know, repeatedly exposed. So the um, dopamine response is dulled. Um, so this is a, a review point. So the three, I, the, the question we were just answering here is like, why are adolescent brains more susceptible to addiction? So there were sort of three main points I was trying to make. What, what were some of them? Anyone got any of them? <laughs> no wrong answers. What's that? Repeat the question. If we repeat the question, what were the three main reasons why the adolescent brain is different from the adult brain? What are three? The prefrontal cortex is developed. That's right. The, the prefrontal cortex is not yet developed, exactly. So the control systems aren't fully on board or as, as they will be by the time they're mature. So that's one. Pruning and myelination. Pruning and myelination. They're making super highways and that has a, that is happening then during adolescence. So those repeated behaviors can become um, hardwired much more than they can during, during adulthood. Yep, and there was one more. They're, they're risk takers and, and, um, and uh, 
three board systems. That's three. right. Exactly. The amygdala and the wow, you I was sure <laughs> that we were not gonna get all three of these on the first try. And I was like, I know what's gonna happen. People are gonna give me totally right answers that aren't the answers I thought of. <laughs> and then I'm gonna be like, oh you're right. Um, so anyway, yes, we did that exactly right. Um, so those are the three the three main points. So dependence on substances, drugs and alcohol and other and, and I would add video games and you know, cell phone, the ping that goes off when you get a like and all of that stuff, but dependence on substances is highly correlated with early use, which is not surprising given what we just saw, right? So 40% of those who begin drinking at age 15 will develop an alcohol use disorder. And only seven, as compared to only 7% who begin drinking at age 21. So here's age at first use and this is prevalence of alcohol use disorders. So you can see for each year that a young person waits to begin using alcohol, their risk of dependency goes down. Now we can't, we can't claim causation, and that's gonna be a theme throughout this presentation. We can't say that it's because they waited, but we can theorize that, um, that because of all the things that we just talked about, about the developing brain and because of the coping strategies that you're learning during adolescence and the habits and the friendships that you, that you create during that time, we can theorize that there is at least in part some, you know, a chicken and egg, but a ca some piece of causal relationship, I believe there is, so. Yes? When you say a child who begins drinking, are you saying a child that tries drinking or a child that That's is an drinking? That's excellent question. I don't know if, which, what this study is referring to. I do know that like first sip for non-religious purposes is relevant to use. Like there are a number of studies that, you know, that, that will use any drink not regular use, but first first drink that's not for religious purposes as the marker of age of first use. Jeanette, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it does vary study to study. I know Ruth Bosley has maybe said something about regular use, meaning Yeah, so, so it can vary study to study, but um, but th there is sort of, there is a difference between, you know, even some use has some impact according to some studies. Is that for definitive? <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're gonna see a lot of that because it's gonna get less and less definitive as we go along. There's a lot we don't know. So, especially here, right? So how does marijuana affect the developing brain? Um, first, a little bit about marijuana. The marijuana plant, cannabis, has about 480 natural chemical compounds. The two that we hear about the most are THC and CBD. Um, CBD stands for cannabidiol, and <coughs> THC stands for tetrahydrocannabidiol. And those are the, the two substances we hear the most about, with um, THC having the sort of more hallucinogenic effects, um, and CBD um, often being attributed many of the more calming effects. But there's all these different chemicals, and they work in, um, together in ways that we don't necessarily understand at all. So, like most drugs, both THC and CBD mimic natural brain messengers. That's a lot of times what a drug is, is like something that mimics the natural messengers in your brain and causes a pleasure, pleasurable response, but maybe in higher amounts. So you can see this is anand anand anandamide, anandamide, I don't know how you say it. Um, but that is the, the brain's chemical that is associated with pleasure, and here's THC, and they have very simil similar um, chemical uh, structures. <coughs> so um, cannabinoid receptors are found all over the body. So the body has many, many places that THC and CBD can attach to those receptors throughout the brain, throughout the body. Um, so, and other cannabinoids also from marijuana can bind with these natural receptors and alter natural signals. So some of the, oh, before I get there, um, I think everyone has probably heard this, 
but so THC is the psychoactive ingredient, CBD the non-psychoactive ingredient. Um, since the 1960s, we've seen a dramatic increase in the amount of THC in marijuana that is, you know, out in the around. And of course, it depends on the particular batch of marijuana. Um, the CBD levels have remained more or less pretty, pretty constant, but this has gone up tremendously. So whereas in 1960, the THC level concentration was 0.2%, now this is 2011, so this is not recent data, it's 11.4%. So, you know, what, what we were smoking in college, not to, in, you know, hurting myself too much, but like what, what people were smoking in college is not the same as what is available today. Um, and what your parents were exposed to in college was not the same either. Um, and there is now this proliferation of THC concentrates. Um, this is some pictures of them, some common street names for them, um, but oils and butters and shatters and hash oil. Um, and it can also come in many different forms, right? You can smoke marijuana. There's lots and lots of proliferation of edibles, which is the biggest sort of market share growing. Um, beverages now with marijuana, uh, vaporizing, and other forms. Um, so that's a big change from what we have known. Um, acute effects of using marijuana during intoxication. So here we have the brain and altered judgment is a possibility, slowed reaction time, euphoria, increased appetite, panic, paranoia, psychosis, impaired memory. Now it's not to say that everyone is experiencing all of these every time. These are, these are um, effects that can happen, obviously. Impaired coordination, altered pain sensitivity, and anti-nausea effects. Now you can see that a number of these are very positive, right? There's positive effects, there's negative effects, there's all different things. Um, like, you know, you can imagine, obviously, anti-nausea effects can be very helpful for people. Um, increased appetite, these are, there is so much that we um, still don't know in ways that marijuana may be very useful that have not been studied. There are also many different kinds of effects that can happen. So here's a little bit about marijuana and driving. Um, lab and simulator studies show that marijuana impairs driving skills, and the more THC in the marijuana, the greater the impairment. Um, what's interesting is, though, that when people uh, use marijuana and then drive, they think they are at least as good a driver, if not a better driver. They don't recognize the impairment that they're feeling. Now, it is true that alcohol impairs you more than marijuana for driving, but that doesn't mean that there's not impairment for marijuana. And it also doesn't mean that introducing marijuana will mean that drunk driving will go down. In Colorado, what they saw with driving, I think it was Colorado, not Washington, I don't remember, it'll say um, in a minute, but uh, marijuana only, drivers who had, you know, were driving impaired, only 33% of them uh, were just under the influence of marijuana. Um, the rest had marijuana and alcohol or other drugs and alcohol or just other drugs. So, and those effects can be sort of compounding. So marijuana used with alcohol causes greater impairment than either one alone. And it is Colorado in 2014. Of drivers testing positive for THC, two thirds had alcohol and or other drugs in their system as well as marijuana. So, um, anyone have questions? Because I'm not used to this much silence. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going all right in terms of pace? Yeah. Can you speak to um, heavy metals? In or are you going to touch I can't. on that list? I can't answer that question. It's a really good one because that's not regulated at all. Or yeah, or uh, I can't answer that one. I don't know. I know, um, like with vaping, which vaping devices can be used to smoke marijuana, and I know there is a concern that heavy metals show up in um, the vapor, the vapor, the aerosolized. Um, chemicals that come through a vaping device, um, but I, I don't know much more than that. Does that 
Does anyone else know more than that that to share briefly? Okay, sorry about that, okay. but good question. Ask a different question. Yeah. Why are the levels so much higher? Um, why are the levels so much of THC going up? Because of breeding. Yeah, because um, you know people have been breeding the plant for a greater and greater effect. So, and I, I suspect that will happen, you know, continue to happen more and more as the industry now is involved and incentivized to um, to breed and you know, so on. So, other questions? I have a question. Yeah. You, you said that. Um there are natural receptors in the human body that THC and CBD attach to. And I've heard that as an argument for the, the pro marijuana industry yes. that, hey, it's it's pretty natural and we're already hardwired to receive these chemicals. Yes. And so, yes. I mean. And that's a big theme in like Michael Pollan's book. Uh, he writes about um, how marijuana was evolved, you know, and. and so what's my argument against that? My argument against that is so is heroin. I mean, heroin mimics natural receptors, opioids mimic natural receptors, heroin comes from the poppy seed. Uh, nobody would say, oh, therefore heroin is natural and therefore it should be fine, or morphine, or whatever. Um, so I, I, that's not an argument saying it's bad, marijuana is bad, but it's an argument saying just because it mimics a natural receptor does not make it good, just because that's, that's what all drugs do. Especially given how much it's been altered. Right. I mean, that's right, especially given how much it's been altered because it's not the same drug that, it's not the same plant. But what we're using now, what you're getting in, an, in, a, in a beverage with marijuana is not the same as what came out of plants 100 years ago. So, um, good questions, thank you. Yeah? With it, with it being legal now, we were just saying, are the THC levels gonna be regulated? Yes, yes, um, it's, Yes, uh, but I think we we're all waiting to see exactly how it happens. Like uh -huh. at this point, you hear stories. Um, my colleague Alana had a story, or somebody had a story of like being on a plane going home from California, and the person next to them had a marijuana infused beverage and drank it, and had a psychotic episode. Did not realize that the serving size of that beverage was one capful. Oh one capful oh was the serving size. So, I mean, we're, we're fortunate, like, you know, the ODing on marijuana is, yeah. is not a, a common thing. It's not, um, but having a psychotic episode is not a happy feeling for somebody um, who thinks they're associated with us. And in reference to the ODing thing, but also the drug interactions, um, like with prednisone. Yes. And marijuana, it's not a good combination. Yeah. A lot of my clients, I've seen, I've seen patients go psychotic when they have a respiratory infection and the doctor prescribes prednisone. Wow. And they're still using. That's a good point. Because That's they something don't I'm tell very, the doctor yeah. the whole story. That's a really good point. And they go psychotic. Yeah. 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 What is the legal age for someone to be able to cru cruise down to Northampton? 21. 21. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, how, and how strict are they? I think right now very strict. It's not to say that a 20 year old couldn't still get marijuana from, you know, the old sources, right? I mean, access was never much of a barrier for marijuana. Kids could get marijuana before it was legal. That's definitely true. Um, and, uh, you know, legal marijuana will certainly increase access if, through some channels, um, but I think the concern might be more like, advertising and so on and I think Massachusetts I think has been you know doing a pretty good job of prepping regulations to make it um, pretty pretty friendly to prevention for, for preventing youth use so I'm gonna keep moving but don't let that stop you if there's burning questions so um, how does marijuana affect the developing brain oh so this is the second half of that second question which is what are the longer term effects okay so we just talked about what happens when you're high um, this one we have, yeah, there's so many more questions than answers about this, right? It, because marijuana has been a schedule one drug, we have not been able to do studies on this. There's been no federal funding for studies. We know very little about the positive and negative effects um, in terms of like scientific knowledge. Um, but one thing researchers agree on is that frequent marijuana use during adolescence <clears throat> has more serious consequences than use by adults. Okay, 
that's that if there's one main message that I've got today for you that's it okay <laughs> um, so here are some of the potential longer-term effects of regular marijuana use on youth development issues with attention memory and learning uh, poorer educational and life outcomes. Now, again, I just want to remind you, this is potential longer-term effects. Um, more questions than answers here, but we have reason to believe these could be issues, right? Poorer education and life outcomes. Loss of IQ for persistent heavy users. Again, a potential um, longer-term effect, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about each of these. And potential for addiction to marijuana and increased risk of addiction to other drugs. So let's, oh, and increased risk, whoops, risk of, risk of psychosis, but anyway, increased risk of psychosis. So here we go. Deficits in cognitive functioning among active users. Many studies show that adolescents who use marijuana heavily tend to score worse than non-users on tests of attention, verbal learning, memory, and processing speed. That could be causation or correlation. We don't know. We know there, well, we know there's a correlation. Um, but, and also even when they're not high. So here's the correlation for verbal <coughs> learning. Non-users are scoring much better than, or significantly better than marijuana users in terms of verbal learning. And then memory here, delayed recall, non-users versus users. Um, deficits are larger for those who <coughs> use more and those who begin using more. <coughs> and this piece of evidence sort of lends some credibility to the fact that there may likely be some causality there because with sustained abstinence, functioning is largely restored. So that kid who then stops using for a couple of weeks and retests their, um, their responses. So this is two weeks of abstinence. You know, here's the gap between users and non-users. And then with two weeks of abstinence, three weeks of abstinence, we're seeing a closing of that gap. Okay. Um, adult life outcomes affected by marijuana use in adolescents. So these are adults who were using significantly when they were, or who were using at different levels when they were adolescents. So this is using zero times and the percent that were college grad by age 25, all the way down to using 400 or more times and the percent that were college grads. So you can see there's a, a correlation between mar you know, regular marijuana use and college graduation, and also a correlation between regular marijuana use and unemployment. So the more times people were using marijuana, the more likely they were to be unemployed. Again, could be correlation, could be causation, probably some combination of the two, right? Um, <clears throat> so increasing use of marijuana from age 15 to 21 was also associated with lower relationship quality and lower life satisfaction at age 25. To me, this is, you know, That's when I think about my kids, like college grad by age 25, like, you know, that'd be nice, but like life satisfaction and relationship quality, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, not that, whatever, everyone has their <laughs> stuff. Um, so loss of adult IQ associated with marijuana dependence in adolescents. So here I'm talking about dependence, not casual one-time use. This is the study is regular use. So <clears throat> the most comprehensive study of marijuana and cognitive function that has been done to date was the Dunedin study. Um, I think it's Dunedin, which followed um, a thousand individuals from birth to age 38. They assessed their IQ at age 13 and at age 38 and they assessed their marijuana use and dependence at five different points in time, from 18 to 38. So fair amount of information collected over a long period of time on about 1,000 people. Um, and they controlled for use of alcohol and other substances and for socioeconomic status and for years of education. What they found was that those who developed marijuana dependence before age 18 showed an IQ decline in adulthood. So this is sort of, a, um, science's attempt to look at causality um, through longitudinal studies. So the longer their dependence persisted, the greater the, the decline in IQ, with a decline of eight IQ points for the most persistent users. Um, those who began using in adulthood did not show IQ decline. And quitting in adulthood did not restore functioning in those who began in adolescence. 
does it somewhere it says somewhere it said um, eight IQ points if you were started out as average like 50th percentile in IQ and you lost eight IQ points I think that puts you at the 26th percentile in IQ so that's a significant drop especially if we're talking across populations right if we have lots of kids becoming dependent on marijuana you know or and even if you're not talking across population even if you're talking to your own kid right that's a big deal <laughs> so um, so there were other studies however other good quality studies that showed no association between marijuana use and IQ loss um, these two studies had um, good sample sizes and found no association between marijuana use and IQ after adjusting for various co-founders and so on. The difference was um, these studies were less heavy use, less frequent use. So they're, they're not necessarily a contradiction of the Dunedin study, but it may be that the picture is a little more complicated that light use of marijuana during adolescence doesn't necessarily have these strong effects and heavy use so, um, one of the other things that we worry about <coughs> with marijuana use during adolescence is psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, the centers in the brain that are activated um, during marijuana use are some of the same centers that are activated during a psychotic episode. You know, that's it's sort of the um, you know creativity centers and so on, but. Um, Marijuana use at age 18 and later risk of schizophrenia. So the number of times the marijuana was used is correlated with the number of cases of schizophrenia um, or the, the, the likelihood of schizophrenia in um, adulthood or later risk of, I don't know if it's adulthood, later, whatever later means here. <laughs> um, here's a different study here or a different graph uh, regular marijuana use seems to increase schizophrenia risk in those with the gene for schizophrenia. So you don't necessarily know if you have the gene or not, but the, those who were genetically susceptible um, and who were daily users, mm -hmm. that's them. So they're, they were seven times more likely to develop schizophrenia than any of the rest of the cohorts, especially, you know, it looks like, like 14 times more likely than, than the ones who were susceptible and didn't use. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so here we go. How common is youth marijuana use? Um, so this is the percentage of US 12th grade students who report past month use of cigarettes, marijuana, and alcohol. And this is national data. Um, so we have these really nice trends in alcohol use going down, cigarette use going down, Marijuana's been peaking up a little bit. Okay, so that's national data. Local data, this is our Franklin County and North Quabbin teens, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders that we survey every year, about 2,000 kids. Um, and this is the data on alcohol use, marijuana use, and cigarettes. If there's two things you remember from this presentation, I hope you remember this. Most kids are making healthy decisions, and more and more they are. Yeah? What tools do you pull? Um, Greenfield, Gil Montague, Mohawk, Pioneer, Frontier, Mahar, Athol, Four Rivers, and Franklin County Technical School. So just the public, not the private? Just the public, not the private. How come? Um, uh, I don't have a great answer for that question, but because we have public funding for the, the residents of the county, so that's where we, 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 we're definitely open to conversations with the private schools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, where is the next E-cigarettes, we only started measuring, and they just went like this. Yeah, so that's a big issue. And I really believe that kids have been given, the kids have been given really misinformation from the companies. I mean, there are plenty of e-cigarette packages that say zero milligrams of nicotine. Mm. And kids think that they're using, and then you look on the back, and it says this product contains nicotine. And then they've done testing. And there's like seven, 24, there's nicotine in there. So um, that is a, a big issue that we are trying to get on, absolutely. But I realize I only have fewer minutes left of my car, so I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, percentage of local youth reporting past month use of marijuana by grade. So here we are, this is the eighth graders locally. 
In 2003, 19% had used in the past month. And here we are in 2018, 6%. So there's a really nice decline. There's still room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And who knows what's going to happen with that now that we have legal marijuana. That's why we need to keep our eye on the prize. That's eighth graders, though. Those are young kids, right? Why are you not a seventh grader? Um, <laughs> and then 10th grade, also a nice decline. 12th grade, not as much of a decline, right? We're not seeing such great patterns. But um, anyway, that's the breakdown. And here we have the breakdown by gender. Uh, here we have some gender equity happening at the expense of, <laughs> at, at the expense of girls' health, right? <laughs> so, um, and here's by uh, demographic group, just so we, we are aware of what's happening. Um, it is definitely an issue among all um, racial and ethnic groups, sexual orientation and family income, but there are some that are at greater risk, um, and that's just important for us to be aware of. Here's. Um, white kids, uh, and this is pooled over multiple years so that um, so that it's a, a high enough sample size to be um, relevant. But you can see that um, students that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, I'm not sure, have higher rates of use. Lower income youth have higher rates of youth use, and for the most part, um, non-white students have higher rates of use. And you know, I really believe that the companies um, also know how to target uh, most vulnerable youth in terms of lower income and so on, so that's something we need to be aware of. Um, this is just important information for us to have. The overlap between current alcohol, cigarette, and marijuana use. So these are marijuana users, right? This is the ones that only use marijuana. This is the ones that use marijuana, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana and alcohol, just alcohol. Anyway, so you just get an idea that there's a fair amount of overlap. And a lot of times kids feel like, oh, there's the pot smokers and there's the um, drinkers. But actually, that Venn diagram has kind of uh, been blurred a, lot, a fair amount. But important to remember that 7 in 10 students do not use any alcohol, cigarettes, or marijuana. And that's this whole white part. And that's the message that we need to get out to students so that they actually feel like it's safe to be in the majority. Yeah? Is this still local? This is still local, yes. Mm -hmm. All these graphs, pretty much. No. What? Student eight, meaning K through 12? No, thank you. This is um, our survey of 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students in those nine public school districts I mentioned. Yep. K is that problematic group? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so in my remaining two minutes, actually it's remaining 30 seconds, but um, <laughs> My remaining two hours are still. Uh, what can we do to help prevent youth use? This is important. Um, disclaimer. Yes, see, this is my, I always forget the disclaimer, so I've added these exclamation points. The disclaimers are you can do everything, we can do everything perfectly, and some kids will still use. And as a parent, like, you can do everything by the book, and your kid will still use. So I just want to be sure that this does not sound like blaming to anyone whose kid is experimenting or anything like that. But there are things that we can do to help reduce the risk as a community, as individual parents, and so on. So I just wanted to make that disclaimer. Um, one, community. What are our kids, this is my son, by the way, one of them, what are they seeing on the streets? What, you know, what are, what are the, the um, scenes that they are uh, exposed to when they walk around. What does it look like adults do in the community? Um, including advertising and marketing. This is an ad uh, from Colorado, Free Dab, a classic drug dealer um, uh, <laughs> move. You know, free Dab for your first time or whatever. Uh, advertising. What are we seeing on the sides of our buildings? This was a medical marijuana uh, clinic in Colorado with like Cookie Monster and everything that kids were walking past to get to school, right? But meanwhile, this is a Northampton dispensary, right? So we're doing something right to begin with. And I'm, I'm not saying everything, but uh, but you know we have choices that we have to make as a community. Um, here's products and packaging like this, and we have other alternatives, right? Um, 
Prevention in schools. We are fortunate that all of our local schools have this wonderful life skills program in the middle schools that teaches kids social skills and emotional skills that have been proven to be effective at reducing youth substance use and violence and making for ha healthier, happier young people. So um, make sure that your school is doing this wholeheartedly and that uh, young people that you work with are, are getting the information. Um, this is a little bit about life skills that I'm just going to skip, but here's also, um, oops, this is uh, another program that all the schools are now doing that typically the school nurses, but in some cases guidance counselors, are having a conversation with every student in ninth and maybe 10th grade, ninth grade and one other grade about their substance use and asking them, like, do you ever use? And they're opening up a conversation and getting a referral if the kid is using heavily. Um, so that's an, another great uh, prevention in the community strategy. And then prevention in the family. How wrong do your parents think it is for you to use marijuana? Kids who say very wrong, 64% don't use. Uh, kids who say wrong, 16% don't use. Do I have this right? Am I saying this right, Jeanette? And then, it not wrong at all. Um, what is the X, what is the? In any case, the point is, that parental attitudes about substance use are highly, highly correlated with youth, youth use. Kids do care what their parents think, whether they say it or not. We have a big influence on our young people. Oh, this is what, that's what it is. <laughs> so I was like, something's missing here. <laughs> so of the 64% who say, it's, my parents say it's very wrong, only 7% of them used. Of the 8% who say, my parents say it's not wrong at all, 75% of them use. Okay. So, um, the hospital was super generous to print these beautiful marijuana talk kits for everyone who came tonight. And this is such a lovely tool, so please check it out. And another tool that we want to make sure you know about is there's an app that you can download for free onto your phone called Talk They Hear You. And you can practice. It's a 10 to 15 minute experience where you talk to a little computerized kid about alcohol and drug use and it's, it's very cool. I, I recommend giving it a try if you want to. 10 to 15 minutes. Um, there was one other resource that I was talking with somebody about mentioning. What was it? Yikes. Parenting overload. Thank you. <laughs> so right, also another resource that I don't have listed up here is that the North Quabbin Community Coalition is offering a free text messaging program for any parents that text, they'll, they'll text like once a week with tips and um, notices and inspirational whatever quotes and stuff. So if anyone wants to get involved with that, we're gonna have, or get on that list. We have some evaluations at the end. We're gonna ask for your feedback and you can write that in um, there tonight. So thank you. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. We have time for more question and answer at the end. Oh, all your resources. Oh yeah, a lot of them. And by the way, the PowerPoints for my presentation and Cheryl's are already on the Communities That Care Coalition website. So, okay. So, thank you, Kat. That was awesome. I learned a lot. I don't know about you guys. Uh, it's really super helpful. So, my part of the presentation is about. Um, how to actually have a conversation with kids about something that's pretty challenging. So my name is Cheryl Pescucci. I'm a family nurse practitioner here at Bay State Franklin. So I'm not a teacher and I'm not a therapist. I'm really coming at this as a healthcare provider. And here at the hospital, what you may probably haven't heard, but um, what we're doing here is training every hospital employee with, uh, which is like 14, 16,000 employees and something called Compassionate Connections. And the whole point of it is to, how do you have really difficult conversations with folks about things that are, you know, tend to trigger us and, and we react to. So we're all employees here. It's a four hour training. If you're a contractor and you come in this building, you're gonna go through this training. And I thought, like, that's really good fodder for this conversation because 
we, we want to know how to make a connection so in this conversation so we don't freak each other out and we're not reacting, we're not reacting, they're not reacting. And I thought if we could just sort of share some of the ways that this has been really successful for us. I've been a facilitator for Compassionate Connections for the last couple of years. I've also been trained um, in stress management at the Benson Henry Institute of Mind Body Medicine at Mass General. So I, I have this, um, this real interest in how to just have a conversation with, um, with folks about things that are, that are super difficult. So we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit about how we do this in, in practice. And a lot of it has to do with the risk versus benefit of all of the decisions that we're making. So in medicine, we, it doesn't matter what it is, if it's a pill, if it's a procedure, if it's surgery, we go through this process of saying, what is the risk versus the benefit of doing this, this thing, taking this pill or taking this drug or, or, or whatnot. And what we, we know to be true is that these, um, the ways that we, we are teaching kids, all the work that the, um, the Communities That Care Coalition are doing and whatnot about building resiliency, that there's zero risk and just so much benefit. So all of these things that we can do to help build our kids' resiliency is prevention for ultimately having any issues with, with addiction and, and whatnot. So we really want to talk about healthy behaviors when, when kids even come to us and say, like, what do you think about this? I would say, well, we want you to be as healthy as possible. And really that what Molly said about the mission here at the hospital, you know, in the olden days, what happened in the hospital was kind of what happened in the hospital, but it is a new day, right? So our, our objective is really the health and well-being of the entire community, this whole Franklin County area and the North Quabbin area is, is what we're interested in. So this is a huge part of, of what um, our, our goals are. So can you read that? <laughs> have you seen this before? So Jeremy, have you been listening to me? Uh, yeah, well, no, but I am now. If you said anything important over the last few years, it would be a really good time to repeat it. <laughs> So one of the things that we learn in Compassionate Connections is this idea of be aware and prepare. So just noticing like what's going on with your, with this kid, like how subtle changes happen. Um, they used to sing in the shower and they don't do it anymore. Uh, but just being aware to, to the subtleties is a gift, right? It's just your, your ability to sort of sit and notice and assess what's, what's going on and then to prepare yourself. So when, when something as challenging is about to happen, like um, something, you know the conversation needs to happen. So how do you get yourself in a good place where you can have a reasonable conversation without that trigger, without that reactivity? So when Molly was talking about a child's brain developing from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. This is gonna blow your doors off. <laughs> but 95% um, of the time, even as adults, we are only using that back part of our brains. Mm -hmm. We almost never, 5% of the time, does a thought that we're having, an experience we're having, actually make it to the prefrontal cortex in our brain where reality testing happens where we, re we critically think about anything. Some of you have heard me say this <laughs> before. But this is the reason why we actually need to take a moment, like to get ourselves in a good place to have this conversation. It can't just be reacting in the moment because it just burns bridges. So <clears throat> when you think about, all right, 95% of the time, I'm, I'm, my fear response is triggered. Just this conversation about marijuana can be really triggering for us, even with us, like in this room, never mind with, um, with a child. So we know that this, this call it, we call it the stress response. The stress response is the reason for 60 to 90% of all visits to primary care. So the reasons why we're feeling the way we're feeling, a lot of this has to do with the, how much stress that we are feeling around lots of issues, but but in particularly now with, um, with, with drug use and, and marijuana. 
So if you think, how do I, how do I prepare myself for this conversation? We want this, this, um, this experience, we want to be able to access all of our prefrontal cortex, all of the critical thinking and, and all of our, our synapses working together. So just about stress a little bit, these are just the, um, the conditions, this is brand new research, 2018, about our, our having our sleep impacted. So um, not getting enough sleep has a ton of of, um, it's called allostatic load, but it, what it means is the stress that happens to your body when we don't get good restful sleep. So just think that's one thing, right? <laughs> think of all the things that could cause stress on our body. So real physical conditions to, um, to stress. And the reason why this is all so important is because of genetics. So. When Ma, when uh, Kat was talking about the 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 um, the risk of schizophrenia, if you have a gene that's um, that that you're predisposed to schizophrenia, so right, so you have your DNA that's lined up in a particular way. It's what we believe. That's what we're how we're hardwired, right? So these are the kinds of things that we believed. If those are if that's my gene pool, like that's what's that's what's going to happen to me. But what we know now, and maybe you've heard about this, epigenetics, which means above the gene, it's actually the bath that your genes are swimming in. So all of the substances that you take into your body, the exercise that you do, the good chemicals that are released when you have a good restful sleep, all of those things add to this healthy or not bath that your genes are swimming in. So when we talk about risk versus benefit, risk is involved when you put a substance in your body that could negatively affect a gene, the way that it expresses itself, okay? So what you want is that gene, that bath, to be as healthy as possible. You want the best bath, <laughs> right? We want our kids to have the best bath. So, all the, so the, the thing about this, right, is that when you're under stress, your body is releasing cortisol and adrenaline and these and, and um, hormones that are are toxic to your cells. They're they're hurting your cells. So that's not what we want. Obviously, we want nice, healthy cells. But this, when you think about having this conversation, and you're stressed about it, your that's a nerve cell in your brain under stress, and this is what it looks like normally. So normally. Our nerve cells are all touching one another like a tree, right? They're all connecting. All of our synapses are talking to one another. Your, your messages are getting from one end of your, your brain all the way to your prefrontal cortex. But under stress, this is an effect of cortisol, your, your nerves shrink and they're not connecting. So you're not thinking clearly. You're not using all your brain cells to have this conversation. And it's, you're going to notice. So you can tell, right, when somebody's reacting, um, if you if you jump to a conclusion, or or um, you can tell that there's like a it's a stress response versus a relaxation response. It's really it's 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 evident. You can tell when your kid's stressed, right? You can tell when there's when they're reacting. You just say one thing and and they go off. That's that's a reaction. And we do the same exact thing as adults. Do I have a minute? What do I have, five minutes-ish? <laughs> All right, well, let's do this exercise, um, if you don't mind. It'll only take a minute. So if you could just, uh, let me grab a chair. Just sit yourself in your chair in a way that your, your feet are flat on the floor and you're sitting, you know, feel the weight of yourself in your chair, but then you don't have to close your eyes, but if you want, go right ahead. But if you could just stare at a place on the floor about three feet out, that's, you know, not very entertaining, just something sort of boring. And what I'm going to have you do is just take some deep breaths. Let yourself relax into your chair. Feel the weight of yourself in your chair. And what I'm going to have you do is, if you don't mind, just picture 
yourself on a swing, swinging back and forth as high as you can go. You're, it's out in the middle of a field. You can see the grass is sort of blowing in the wind. It's a beautiful blue sky. And the clouds are floating by. You know, maybe you can hear some kids playing in the background. Okay, now wipe that away and I want you to picture yourself standing on a bridge, a small wooden bridge, and underneath you there's a stream that's flowing from behind under the bridge and out in front of you and you can see it just um, the floating away and there's an, actually a leaf that's bobbing on top of the water and it's hitting the, the rocks and going farther and farther away. Now wipe that away and I want you to picture a, pi a ping pong table with uh, ping pong balls and two ping pong battles crisscrossed over each other on top of that ping pong table. Okay, you can open your eyes. So could you picture those things? Could you move from one image to the next image to the next image? So the point of this is that you have control over what you think about or what you focus on. Like this is in your control. And sometimes it feels like we get sort of flooded with thoughts and those thoughts rule our lives, but really we have an opportunity to sort of focus on what you want to focus on. And if I, if one thing, like <laughs> Kat was saying, if you could take something away with, with what she had to say to you, I would say the one thing that um, would be most important about what I have to say is focus on what you want. Focus on what you want is the end game, not necessarily the behavior. There's a lot of work around uh, about making uh, compassionate connections, what that feels like. And it's always about, not so much about the, the behavior, but what is that underlying need? What is that kid really looking for? So if we can focus on what's the underlying need, both of us will win, right? We're all, we're all in this together, because kids also want to be happy. So this is the difference between simply reacting to a stimulus and having this mindful pause before reacting. And it's just practice, literally practice. So it's also our choice about how, how what the style is like working with a, with a child, right? Is they're looking for warmth, but also working for structure, looking for structure. So this way of, you know, being authoritative and, you know, still showing them the, the love. One thing that we do in Compassionate Connections is called heart, head, heart. You probably heard it in other ways, but it's really about saying something to the child that's very heartfelt. Then you lower the boom with whatever it is that you know you want them to do or you don't want them to do, and then wind it up at the end with something that's very heartfelt is like structure and warmth at the same time. So it can be really powerful. And then this idea about how to how to have these bonding opportunities is you know, what, the, what are opportunities exist and, and then building these skills and then recognizing them for the skills that, um, that they're excelling in is just a really great way to, to bond. So in our, in our books, there's actually, these are pretty clearly written out because I'm coming up at the end of my time on page 10 and page 11. So getting in the right frame of mind to set the stage for this conversation. Um, so keeping an open mind. Think about the underlying need and not so much the behavior. You know, really what is this kid looking for? Being empathetic, putting yourself in their shoes. So compassion is, is empathy, but it's a verb. Like compassion is, is actually doing something about it, right? It's not just, I can put myself in your shoes. It's, it's, um, it's really doing an action that shows them that you, how much you care, how much, how, and how much empathy you have. To be clear about your goals, and again, with the end game in mind. You know, you want your, your kids to do all those things that Kat was talking about, is you know, finishing college maybe, and, and, and making these, these life choices, being able to be employed, and all those, kind of, that, that's the end game. Being calm and relaxed, this mindful pause, being positive, not necessarily lecturing, finding um, a good setting and uh, good timing, so in the moment when the heat of it may not be the best time to have this conversation, right? You just give yourself some time to in a, in a neutral place where you can where you can have this conversation, and then just be really careful with your body language because 
you know, if you're standing and the kid is sitting, you know, there's this power thing. Um, try to keep your, your posture open. And, but that's all in your, in your book as well, just so you can look back at it. So then to go back to the beginning, the risk versus benefit of building resiliency, <coughs> anything that we can do to, to help build this, again, healthy bath, right? All of these things help to keep that place that your genes are living in as healthy as possible. So healthy food, getting restful sleep, we could talk about that all day. Um, physical activity, has, it's, it's good for all kinds of things, but for leaving depression and, um, and anxiety, and we could also talk about that all day. These stress management strategies about really um, noticing the reactivity that, that we all have, managing screen times and social media because your, your brain believes it to be true whether it's a video game or not. Your, your brain um, is malleable that way. Tending to relationships, right? We want this, this unit, we want our, this to be a, a healthy relationship and then to avoid any kind of substance that when you add it to this bath could hurt your genes, right? Because we don't know, right? We don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right.